about a year ago, I interviewed Lila Robbins, who in the past several years has starred in two plays at the Williamstown Theater Festival. Her more recent appearances there have become part of her WTF legacy, and I want to bring Lila Robbins back for my show on GNAT TV. Lila is widely respected and admired by her peers in acting. Uh, she has an accomplished career of credits, whether it's motion pictures, television, or stage. And as an actress, she is always working very much in demand for parts and roles. Lila, before we get into your latest project at the Barrington Stage Company, I know that in your career, you've either been nominated or received uh, a number of awards. Uh, and this must be very satisfying to you. Can you share with uh, our viewers some of your award experiences? Oh, uh, well, in the theater, uh, it was lovely that the cast of uh, the Richard Nelson plays, the Apple Family plays, were given an Obie Award for Best Ensemble. So it was great to be honored as a group of actors, because ultimately, it is a group working together. Um, sometimes pulling out individual actors doesn't really make much sense. Uh, but I've also been honored to receive an award from Actors' Equity, which is our union, uh, for sort of um, a body of work during a particular late year where I'd done the Richard Nelson plays and also an Edward Albee play called The Lady from Dubuque. And that was lovely. And um, Drama Desk Awards and... Um, Lucille Lortel, yeah, right? Lucille Lortel, I've had a couple nominations for that. It's always nice to be acknowledged by your peers or the, or the professionals, you know. Um, that's always a wonderful thing. It's kind of a feather in your cap, and it's it's lovely. And also, it was really fun to go with the cast of Homeland when we went to the Emmys. That was very exciting to be on the red carpet, and you know, to wear the gown and be Cinderella for a day. Um, that was fun to be honored as an ensemble again for a, for the best ensemble. Well, although there are so many awards when you look at the Oscars and the Emmys and uh, the Tonys and uh, uh, Lucille Lortel and, and the Drama Desk and what have you, I mean, in reality, the number of artists that earn these awards are kind of small. I mean, uh, it, it's not enormous or widespread. I mean, you yeah. really have to earn it, right? Uh, yes, you have to earn it, but not only that, in some ways, uh, there's a lot more that goes behind it, you know? There's also sort of campaigning for the award. There's press agents that people, I've never had a press agent, but people hire people to help them sort of put their image out there so that they can be more, more well known and get more votes. And sometimes uh, a lot of people vote um, name recognition, you know. So if you're sort of a um, not a household name yet, your chances are pretty slim. Unless you've really done something magnificent and you just pop right out and everyone has to just acknowledge that what you did was outrageously incredible. So there's a whole, there's all a lot of different elements to that, that, that part of it. Lila Robbins, Barrington Stage Company. Is this your first time here? Yes, it is. A Doll's, <laughs> a doll's very, House, part two? Yes, and I'm very happy to be here. I mean, I've been down the way with Williamstown over the years, and that's been so much fun. I got my start there, and then I spent the last two summers there. But to be invited by uh, Joe Calarco, our director, and Julie Boyd into this family is really lovely. And I, I love being in Pittsfield, and, uh, and I hope to come here Again. So something <laughs> something new, right? New new yeah, ground, right? New ground, yeah. And my housing is fantastic. I love my housing. So and <laughs> Joe important. Joe Calarco and Lucas Haneth, mm -hmm. they are we just we just discussed awards. They are award winners too in uh, playwright yes. and directing, right? Yes. Uh, Joe Calarco um, has done many things. I worked with him at the O'Neill Playwrights Conference. We worked on a, a workshop of a musical. Uh, called uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock, which base, is based on the Peter Weir film from, from way back. We worked on that together, so I knew him a bit. I'd worked together with, with him for a week. But it's great to be actually in the room with him working on something uh, that's a production. And Lucas Hanath, I was first um, aware of him when I went to see his play, The Christians, which I think he won awards for. And I was so taken with his play, and I've never written to a playwright before. 
and I found him on Facebook and I wrote to him. I'd never done that before. I wrote to him, I said, I saw your play, I was just astounded by it. I want to do your 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 work someday in the future. Please, you know, consider me. <laughs> I'm waiting in line, you know, and um, and he responded. And um, I don't know if he's coming up to see our production. I hope he does. Um, this will be, I think this is the first uh, production of it outside of New York. They had done it on Broadway uh, with two different actresses, Laurie Metcalf and then Julie White. And I believe this is the first production outside of New York. Now, it's important to distinguish A Doll's House and A Doll's House 2. Okay? Part 2. Part 2. Yeah. And uh, everyone in theater has heard of A Doll's House, a classic. Yes. Uh, Henrik Ibsen from Norway, 1879. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think it's one of the most performed plays of all time, I oh, believe. Oh, wow. You know? Is it really? So, yeah. Well, it was a... It was quite a shocker when it, the first time Controversial, it came out, right? you know, uh, about female emancipation and, and women finding their own voice and their, and the rights and, um, you know, it was very shocking at the time. There, it's very famous for the, the door slam at the end of the play when Nora leaves her husband and she leaves her children as well, which is very tough. Uh, that, that play ends with that door slam and, and it resounded all over the universe and people became very intrigued with this play. But this, this, this new play by, by Hanath, it's 15 years later when Nora goes back and uh, I'm not sure I should give away much more than that. Well, she goes to tell our viewers some of the... Uh, she, uh, what are appetites here? Well, she thought that they were divorced only to find out that they actually are not. And this is a problem. This is a problem. So she goes back to uh, confront her husband, and uh, there is a, um, a meeting with her daughter, and also Anne Marie, the uh, housekeeper and nanny, who, ha who has been now taking care of Torvald, her husband, all this time. So it's a four-character play. And it has written in modern language, so there's a lot of anachronistic sort of language in it. And um, in some ways, our physicality is a little more modern. And that's, that's part of what's going on. It's sort of breaking a mold. It's not strictly, we're not going to be you know, standing around. We have corsets on, but there is more of a freedom within the piece. And, the, and it's also about finding your own voice, which I think Lucas Anath is also talking about an artist finding his own voice. And for me, I've been sort of dealing with this in rehearsal, uh, having so admired Laurie Metcalf's perform her Tony Award winning performance, and she was just amazing. And then I went back to see it with Julie White, and she was amazing in her own way. And I guess I'll be funneling Nora through through me, and hopefully I'll have my own and voice. And you'll be amazing as well. <laughs> that, so, so, so. that remains to be seen. We're almost there. We're in week three, and uh, we're almost there. <laughs> so, so getting back to A Doll's House versus A Doll's House Part 2, mm -hmm. uh, A Doll's House uh, was uh, not only performed uh, uh, so many times, uh, but there was a, a, a movie version, uh, yes. a television version, uh, two major radio drama versions, oh. and uh, must the patron coming to see A Doll's House 2 have familiarity and and have would they have had to have seen a doll's house in order to really enjoy a doll's no. house part two no I, I don't I mean I think it's always lovely to have a context for something and it is sort of a classical play that I think a lot of people probably did read uh, in high school or in college I know I certainly studied when I was at the Yale drama school because what is one of those staples that you just do Ibsen you're gonna read the doll's house you're gonna read Hedda Gobbler um, I've never played Nora in the original uh, play. Uh, I played Hedda Gobbler once, so I have had some, some familiarity with Ibsen generally. But the, the, an audience member, I think, will be able to catch on very quickly as to what is happening. I think some of, some of the humor, you know, Nora in the original play it was very um, uh, 
kind of under Torvald's thumb or always sort of trying to manipulate him and being very uh, girlish in her approach to getting what she wanted. And now she's a different person. She's a very different person when she comes back 15 years later. She's found her strength. She's, she's a businesswoman. She's strong. She's written books. She, she knows more of who she, she is. But it's really not just about women knowing who they are. It's about human beings finding a way to truly be themselves and not be lying. The idea of if you can be truthful in your life, that this is good for everybody, men and women. So it's not just a, sort of a diatribe against men, which there has been plenty of that recently you know, in the news. And it is very uh, uh, timely. Contemporary. As far as, yeah, what's happening in the news these days, the Me Too movement, all of that. But it's not uh, just a harangue against you know, the male sex or something. The, the, the arguments are very well balanced. And it's very entertaining and funny in how it approaches this. So it's, it's, it's a serious subject matter, but it, the way Hanaf deals with it is very comedic at times. And also very moving at times. It has sort of both elements. So I think anybody coming to the theater will, would enjoy the show. So when you're doing revivals or doing different editions of a play that's been previously performed, yeah. or maybe there's a movie version, how much time do you study the past cast, the, well, the characters who did it, uh, their interpretation of the character versus your interpretation? Uh, how much? How much time and diligence do you do you put into that? You know, uh, actors have very different feelings about that. Um, I I enjoy. Uh, if I've watched something in the past, I'll just sort of have a memory of it. But I don't write before I start to work on a role, start to look at everybody's performance. I, I really want to meet the text myself and interpret it myself through, maybe that's foolish, but I would rather sort of come up with what I came up with, with the director and the other actors. And then it's fun for me to look at some of these versions after and go, oh, I made the same choice there, or oh, oh, that was an interesting choice they made, oh, I could have used that. But I don't want to in any way sort of be mimicking or, or trying to fulfill what other people did, because it's got to come through me, ultimately. And if it's a real character, real life character you're playing, what study goes into that? Yeah, when uh, I did a, a TV movie called uh, Too Big to Fail, where I played uh, the British, uh, French uh, Prime Minister of, of, of Finance, uh, no, French, French Minister of Finance, uh, Christine Lagarde. And I studied a lot of video footage of her because I wanted to be like her. And they got me a great wig, and I looked a lot like her. And I, I, I um, studied her, her accent. And she has a very specific accent because it's not, it's not just strictly um, French with the British, inf uh, English with a French accent with the British influence. She actually spent time in Chicago. So she had certain sounds that were very Chicago. And I think, you know, perhaps somebody watching the movie would say, hey, that's not really a, a British French accent, but she actually lived in Chicago. And she actually said the name Hank as Hunk. Which, which, which is bizarre. Why would you call somebody hunk? But she did. And so in the film, I do that. And, and a person came up to me and said, oh, I thought it was so funny when you said hunk. That was weird. I said, well, that's actually how she says that name. And how, sometimes you try to be accurate, and yet people think you're not. You well, know how important is that to a director of a film uh, that you be, again, very dead on accurate versus uh, maybe for the uh, dynamics of the film to to be a different character than well, the than the real true. life character. Yeah, that would be a discussion you would have with the director. But I find, I mean, I haven't had to um, be a lot of real people, so I don't have much experience with that. But I think it really depends on the director discussing that with you. But often, you know, with the film or TV, you don't get a lot of rehearsal or discussion. You sort of show up and just do it. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, if the director does want to have that sort of freedom and leeway, then I suppose they would have some rehearsals to, to find what that would be. Mm -hmm. But uh, I enjoyed trying to, to kind of get her as accurately as I could. I found that um, 
fun. So, Lila, when you start preparing for a role, what is your process from, say, the conceptual and talking stage, like you said how you contacted this playwright and he contacted you back that uh, yes this was uh, this was a good thing and and so from the conceptual talking stage to the casting to walking on finally walking on the set for a, a movie or a play or mm -hmm. television production what's your oh. process there well, <laughs> it is a process that's for sure we were just joking the other day just learning these lines are very difficult because he, he his sentence structure is very unique and also sometimes you say the same thing, but just slightly differently. So first of all, you try to learn the line. Then you try to put a little something behind it. Then you try to get the line verbatim. And then when you start playing with it, sometimes you forget the line because now you're trying to play it in a different way. So there's, there's like five or six stages to actually get, you know, just get the lines out. Um, I don't know, I often, it's wonderful to see what the designers, you know, have in their mind about the look of the piece what you'll be wearing, what, what's your environment, uh, what is the, the context that you're going to be in, you know, is it more abstract, is it more realistic, uh, what are the colors you're wearing, does that feel right? Um, you know, you, sometimes you have a meeting with a, a, a designer well in advance of rehearsal where you don't even know your character all that well yet, but the designer has a thought about it and it might even guide you to where you want to go ultimately. There's a great conversation there. Um, you know, it's uh, repetition, as they say. Repetition, 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 until you can find that freedom within what I call the sort of dot to dot. I work uh, pretty, pretty technically at first, sort of laying in a, a ground plan for where things need to go. And then if I have that s solid map, uh, where I can feel secure and know that those things are there, then within that I can really start to breathe and really start to, to feel the freedom within it and play. But I've got to have that solid foundation or now, I can't fly. Yeah, now on movies and television, I've interviewed uh, uh, actors and actresses who confess their frustration sometimes where they're shooting a scene without the other person who they're supposed to be playing with in the scene. Uh, uh, Raymond Burr, Perry, Perry Mason was notorious for never showing up for any of his scenes oh. and many of the actors, yeah. uh, major actors who uh, appeared in the Perry Mason uh, yeah. television shows, they would sit virtually by themselves just you know talking with, with the doing script, the, the script uh, doing their part the yeah, yeah yeah doing uh, their with, part with sometimes not even any sort of emotion or expression in it yeah. yeah it's very difficult i mean more now i mean on the sets that i've been actors do stay actors do stay and even actors who are working all day long they they often stay too because they realize that that dynamic is important and um, I don't know, I mean, if you're, if you're playing Perry Mason for eight years, you know, maybe by year seven, you're kind of like, I'll see ya, I've done my bit. You know, I mean, it, it depends on, I guess, how big your role is. Yeah, or uh, shooting a scene at a progression, right? That, that is very common, right? Yes, where, yeah, I just did where you might shoot the end b before the beginning, right? Yes, in I fact, mean, I just shot a movie in Budapest where uh, we were in Philadelphia, actually. We shot the exterior of the house when people come to the door at my home, and then we shot the part where they leave my house out the door. But we went to Budapest and then shot the scene that was in the living room. So we hadn't re really even played out the scene in the living room, and we already had to play when they were leaving. So it's very difficult sometimes. And are you at this point so technically experienced that way that that doesn't flummox you at all or doesn't <laughs> bother you that you're doing things out of progression or out of order? Everything flummoxes me. But you just, me. You, just uh, <laughs> you know, plow through it? Well, one tries uh, to persevere and hopefully a little experience helps, but it's, it's, it's being adaptable. That's part of being an actor, is to be very quickly adaptable to either a new line or a new thing that's happening, or now they've rewritten the scene, or it's, it's so much about being able to adapt quickly. 
as my as my teacher used to say at Yale, my, my dear friend Wesley Fata, our, our movement teacher, he said, champions adjust. So. And there's a wonderful story about Meryl Streep when she did um, Arcadena in the park in the Seagull, Chekhov's the Seagull, and she had a hat. And the pin wouldn't go into the hat. And she couldn't get this pin into the hat. And the, and the costumer said, oh my god, went to her and apologized, said, oh my god, I'll fix that hat, I'll fix that hat. And she said, don't you dare. I love having that obstacle. It, it helps with my frustration. I can, I can, I, can, I mean, I, I maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm telling the story that how I heard it. Maybe this is not true, maybe it's true, who knows. But I heard the story and she said, no, I love having that obstacle. So sometimes you get a little thing that gets in the way and instead of making it a problem, you actually make it something or you invent something new and you find something new and then you find that that's kind of a rich little moment and it works for you. Now, Lila, uh, once again, we're here at uh, uh, Barrington stage, and we're in the rehearsal studio here. And again, I mentioned how, uh, what is it, five shows you've done at WTC, right? Five, five productions. Uh, I'm going to say six or seven. Six or seven, okay. And in this northwest eight, Massachusetts, eight or nine, eight or nine. okay, okay. <laughs> This Northwest uh, Massachusetts, Southern Vermont, Southwestern Vermont uh, area, it's infested with a number of <laughs> theaters, uh, the Colonial Theater, uh, the Williamstown uh, Festival, Weston and Dorset in uh, Southern Vermont, and, and there's uh, Theater, the Berkshire, and, uh, and there's more company. Shakespeare. So uh, these theaters are really a reservoir of sorts for testing and experimentation, right? I mean, uh, experienced people like yourself get to test out things and try things and mm -hmm. I guess the emerging actors get to practice their craft. Yes, yeah. the young people, if, most of these uh, theaters have programs for young people which is so important because how else are you going to learn? I mean, in, in some ways, like I, I work at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey often and that's a real teaching theater as well. And so in, in the smaller roles, you've got young people, you know, and they're finding their legs. And, and in some ways, sometimes it makes the production a little uneven as far as the caliber, but it's also very important. And that's how I got my start at Williamstown with Nico Sakharopoulos, giving me opportunities as a young actress to, to sort of learn with other professionals. You know, it's like playing tennis. When you play with somebody better, you're, you're better, you get better. And that's the only way to do it. And I think all of the, the programs here, I, I, I saw a cabaret the other day that the kids did that was just amazing. You would be astounded by the talent. Oh my God, these people can sing. And, um, and we've got young people in our room who are uh, stage management interns and direct, uh, directing interns, and they get to watch the professionals do it and, and learn how it's done. And all of this is so important for the future of Absolutely. this field, right? Absolutely. To pass on so. the baton and to, uh, you know, there's so much to learn. And you keep learning. Your whole life you keep learning. So, um, Speaking of emerging artists, so you started out in Minnesota and uh, first went to college in Wisconsin, right? Yes. And again, uh, mentoring a little bit uh, emerging artists. Uh, these are not prime time places for <laughs> theater and uh, movies and television. They're not New York City or LA, yeah. right? And uh, yeah. how did you accomplish that? Getting from the Midwest and some, and I know you went to Yale School of Drama, yes. uh, but there must have been a threshold going from these, uh, obscure is the wrong word, but the, these nondescript places in the Midwest to, yes. um, you know, the, L.A. and yes. NYC, right? Well, yeah, Oda Hagen, the famous acting teacher, right. did yes. the same thing. You know, her father was a professor of art at University of Wisconsin-Madison, so she found her way <laughs> to New York as well. Um, I, you know, I, there's so much pressure on young people to do it so quickly now, and it's so youthful. Oriented, I was given the luxury of going to a college in the middle of Wisconsin where I had a wonderful acting professor, Will Denson, 
who cast me in so many plays. I got to play the lead in so many plays. I got so much experience being in a, in a smaller place where I got the stage experience. And I, but I also knew by the end of four years that I needed some more technique. So that's why I wanted to go to grad school. And getting into the Yale Drama School was one of the, the most fortuitous things for me. And because it brought me to the East Coast, and then, and then Nico Sakharopoulos was teaching in the undergraduate department who brought me to Williamstown. So that's how that little path happened. But I found that studying your craft, you can do anywhere. And you can do it, as long as you have good teachers, you kind of need that quiet to learn something. And I, I guess I worry about young people because I feel like they're already pulled so much by wanting to be famous or, or, or getting a TV show right away, and they don't even know what they're doing yet. J.K. Simmons doing. talks about being out of the University of Montana starting out. You yeah. Know, and, and yeah. Oh, oh, he went to Montana. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My uh, Mitch. Uh, Love him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, you can learn it anywhere, and, and you have to stay focused on that, the learning of the craft. It's not a business. You know, it's so funny. I was teaching at Fordham. And one of the young people came up to me and said, oh, Lila, we're so tired of doing scenes. We want to do a whole play. And I said, well, the play is made up of scenes. <laughs> you can't do a scene. You can't do a play. You know, I, mean, I think they're very, um, not all of them, obviously, but there's a, there's a tendency to want to get out there and do it. What is it? You have, you have to be in love with the craft and work on the craft and work on it meticulously and seriously. And you really can spot those young people who do have that sensibility, who understand that. But many, many don't. In our remaining minute, Lila, I, I have like to... an old lady talking. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask this question. The past four television serials that you've had roles in, uh, Homeland, Murder in the First, Quantico, and Deception, mm. You're all, you're casting, you're all spies and uh, uh, law enforcement people. What's, <laughs> what's FBI, going on? FBI, what, yeah. ambassadors, lawyers. Well, what's going on here? What's going on? I think it's just, I think it's uh, just kind of a look I uh, have, you know. I'm very patrician looking. Uh, it's funny because I think people think I'm probably... They don't the, suspect you, know, you as the spy. No, right? no, unless I'm a Latvian <laughs> spy. So. My parents are from Latvia, and I'm actually uh, of Latvian descent, and my parents are off the boat, so I'm an immigrant's mm. daughter. Mm. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I just have that lawyer look or something. Um, mm. I'm always very officious and authoritative mm. when, when really inside I'm not. <laughs> See Lila Robbins in The Doll's House Part 2 at the Bennington Stage. No, Barrington. Barrington, Barrington Stage. In Pittsfield. Don't Barrington get Stage in Pittsfield. Barrington. I have Bennington, Vermont on my mind yes. at the Barrington Stage. In Pittsfield. Yes, in Pittsfield, Vermont. Uh, it's a very, very interesting production. And uh, Lila, thank you so much for spending another half hour it's with us. It's so nice us. to see you again, Danny. So, I enjoyed it. Thank so. you. This is Danny Frank for GNAT TV.